answer for me? <clears throat> I'm not gonna mince words, Ben. I want your respect. You, you have it. You, you're not gonna play me, all right? Like a, like, L like, like a piano. <laughs> You think because I'm CEO of a community TV station, I don't deserve your respect? Huh, Mr. Big Shot Magician, Mr. Big Shot Variety Show host, Mr. Big Shot, Big Shot, I have feelings, you know? Oh, I'm sorry, it wasn't my intention to hurt your feelings, just, just play with them a little. I, I don't need to be manipulated. I, I am not an animal. I am a human being. Okay, I'm, no more joking around, I, I, I promise. You, you promise? Thank you, Ben. <laughs> that, that means a lot to me. <sighs> and another one bites the dust. Hey, hey! Weedo. Welcome to Live from St. Kilda. Make some noise for your host, it's Ben Mappy! Thank you so much, what a welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight. You will have to excuse me, I'm a little bit puffed tonight. I've been doing a lot of training this past week as tomorrow begins the Melbourne Marathon Festival, something I'd planned to participate in, but then I decided if I really wanted to run 10 kilometers really fast, I'd head to Broadmeadows and hold my husband's hand. <laughs> or I'd head over to Moscow and wave the pride flag. Or go to middle America and say, I believe in science and guns are dangerous. <laughs> Out of there. I find it amazing that in 2021, there is still so much injustice in the world. Thankfully, today is International Human Rights Day. And I hear that Amazon is celebrating by doubling their workers' lunch breaks, making it an entire seven minutes. And uh, Apple CEO Tim Cook celebrated by visiting his seven-year-old nephew's school art fair. Tim's nephew showed him a phone he'd made with two tin cans and a piece of string. Uh, needless to say, he wasn't impressed. Tim pulled out his iPhone 4000 and said, you think your phone's impressive? Look at the ones seven-year-olds in China are making. <laughs> Ouch. Today sees the end of Melbourne International Jazz Week. To be good at jazz, one has to forget classical theory, be able to sing scat and keep up with irregular rhythms, a little bit like my bowels. Uh, essentially, to be good at jazz, you need to be bad at music. Uh, maybe Meatloaf at the football halftime show 10 years ago was actually doing jazz and not murdering his own song, I'd do anything for love. I'd do anything not to hear that again. And Cardi B, an American, uh, I want to say singer, uh, describes her music as a fusion between jazz and funk. So I think pop them together and it accurately describes it. Junk. Uh, it shouldn't be too harsh on jazz though. My style of hosting has been described as jazz, as uh, it's also not very popular. Oh, thanks. <laughs> on our chit chat tonight, we're joined by the incredible TV producer, Tony Ayres. He's bought some of Australia's best scripted drama TV shows over the last few years. Netflix's Clickbait, Glitch, Stateless, Fires, Barracuda, The Family Law, The Slap and more. The Slap, huh? That sounds like my lonely Friday nights at home in front of the computer. <laughs> yes. Uh, we also have an incredible studio performance from a whole army of young performers from the Patrick School of Arts. So kick up those feet, throw the phone across the room, and welcome to Live from St Kilda! <laughs> Thomas Keating has dropped his cheeky new track, Lunatic, along with his u butte Aussie music video, featuring some very familiar faces. This is the catchy indie pop anthem for millennials and Zoomers who are just trying to get some clarity on how other people think, how others see the world, and why some people refuse to put pineapple on their pizza. And those people are wrong. But Thomas is right. There are many different worldviews out there, and we're lucky enough to be joined by him now. Hello, Thomas. Hey, Ben. Thanks so much for having me on tonight. I'm so excited about Lunatic being out. Uh, this song is about my confusion on everything at the moment. I'm Thanks so much, Thomas. That was an incredible song. My pleasure, Ben. 
Thank you so much for having me. I uh, hope that I might be able to get into the studio to see you soon. Oh, we hope so too. Uh, his song Lunatic is available now. Play along at home and see how you go. It's a random game show. Home indeed. I mean, you won't win the prize, but you can win the couch at home. Exciting stuff. <laughs> hey, Tony, who's playing today? Ben, today's first lucky contestant was once a globe-trotting tour guide travelling the world. Let's say hi to Zoe. Hello, <laughs> Zoe. Welcome. And our second lucky contestant has motorcycled her way along the peaks of the Himalayas. Say hi to Renee. <laughs> Hello, Renee. Uh, a globe-trotting travel guide. Yes. Incredible. Have you ever been as far as, like, Geelong? I went there the other week. It's amazing. <laughs> Yes, I am. <laughs> last, last weekend too. Are you in there as late? Is yes, that as far as you went? Yes. It is, yeah. No further. <laughs> and yourself, you've ridden a motorbikes all around the world. Oh, yes. Lots of lots of accidents, <laughs> no. <laughs> motorbike breaks down, but everyone's so friendly and help you. I mean, that sounds pretty impressive that you've motorbiked across the world, but I've scooted to the end of the street. <laughs> Exciting <laughs> stuff. <laughs> What's our prize? Ben, today's champion will receive a $100 voucher from our fabulous sponsor, Relax and Play, Melbourne's number one kids-friendly family Woo! entertainment centre. Okay, now today we are playing a game called Band or Beer. I'm going to give you the name, uh, and then I'm going to give you the two options you can choose from. Once I've read the two options out, hit your buzzer if you know the correct answer. If you get it correct, you get the point. If you don't, shame to you and your family. The point goes to the next person. All right, here we go. Question number one of Band or Beer. Geriatric Hipster Club. Is it an English band with an average age of 78, brought together for a TV documentary, or a beer equivalent of an old-fashioned with oak bitters and orange peel? Yes! Zoe, you were in first! The first one. Oh, <laughs> no! It was a beer. It's a rave oh, beer produced for the brewery's members. Wow. There you go. So the point goes to you, uh, Renee. Yes. All right, here we go. <laughs> Hoover Stank. Is it a rock band whose name was inspired by a mispronunciation of a street sign or a pungent European-style lager with sour bitter flavour? <laughs> oh, you were in first. It's a band. That's right. Hoover Stank <laughs> was a band. Uh, do you know what their second single was? No. No, it didn't go really well because they Hooper stunk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Kiss the goat. The lead singer's father said he would rather kiss the goat than listen to them play. Or a dark beer described as a perfect... Oh, you were in first! Beer! Correct! <laughs> it is a beer! All right, so at the moment we've got uh, two for Renee and one for Zoe. You need Ooh. the next one to stay in the game. Uh, Zoe, here we go. Snake Dog. Ooh. Is it a rock band name inspired by a shaven-headed fanatic they met after a show? Or an American IPA beer with orange and tropical fruit aromas. That was oh. the most delicate hit of a buzzer ever. Like, mm. What's the answer, Zoe? Beer. Correct! Yeah. It's a beer! Oh. There you go. All right. So we're oh, on a tie, God. and we've got one more question oh. left. Whoever gets this is our winner. Okay. <laughs> Mott the hoop. Hoople, Matt or Matt the Hoople, Mott the Hoople, something along those lines. Is it a 1960s British rock band named after a novel about a circus freak or a biting, bitter tongue bruiser of an ale? Yes! Ale! No, it's a band! Which means our winner is Zoe! Congratulations, Zoe! Well, I'm going to write myself some Christmas cards so it looks like I have friends. Here is your You Go Think clue. It's a wad of cash and something circular. Back after these messages with Izzy Hart and producer Tony Az! Seems even I can't be bothered writing myself Christmas cards. What's the point pretending? Your clue was a wad of cash and something circular. It was, of course, a money ball. Still to come are the incredible talents of Melbourne Follies. This is Chit Chat. Our guest tonight is arguably the busiest TV producer in Australia today. Over the past few years, he's produced some of the most applauded dramas in recent times. Among them, The Slap, Barracuda, Seven Types of Ambiguity, The Family Law, Stateless, Nowhere Boys, Netflix's smash hit Clickbait, and now Fires. Please welcome Tony Az! <laughs> Tony, hello. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, you so much for coming in. Jump down. Pleasure. Hey, Tony, I've got to start off by asking, uh, first up, you're probably the most prominent Australian television producer. 
and yet you arrived today without a limousine, without an entourage, and we've had TikTokers come here with much bigger. Um, <laughs> and I don't think their work relates to yours. Why are you so grounded? Um, <laughs> I guess I've been around for a long time, so I've sort of seen the ups and downs of the industry, and, you know, like, I try not to think, separate my... I try to separate myself from the work I do. Yep. So, I, you know, like... I'm just an ordinary guy and I'm very, very lucky to have had the career I've had. So, you know, that's, that's just me. So you're not running around on set as a tyrant and then um, be this nice, lovely guy out in public? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I pretty much... I can do a certain kind of thing. Like, I, I read scripts and I talk to people and I, you know, try to get people to do their best work and um, I've made a career out of it. That's an incredible career you've had, but I'm curious to know, how does an unassuming, lovely, friendly man from Macau, who started off making deeply personal films, become one of the most applauded producers in Australian television? Um, you have to be persistent. <laughs> you, have to, you have to believe in what you do and that there's some value in what you do and what you've got to say. And, um, you, yeah, you just... It's a roller coaster ride, so, you know, like... You know, sometimes things work out really well and sometimes do things don't work out and, you know, the next day you've just got to get up and you know, do it again. Do, do you ever have... Because um, most people would look at your work and think there's no reason for Tony to ever doubt his work. When you're making a, a production, putting something together, do you have those dates, days that you still doubt it and go, oh, is this the, the right path? Um, probably not now. Probably earlier. I used to... Qu you know, that, that's a question that you have all the time and... Certainly, if things aren't working the way that you, um, you know, you want them to work, I think it's really easy to have a, a you know, imposter syndrome. And you know, when I was first directing, I had it, you know, like I had it really badly. Like a, <laughs> I just knew that I was the least experienced person on the set. Everyone knew more than I did. Yeah. And somehow, so at some point, someone was going to sort of say, you know, you really don't know what you're doing. What are you doing here? Get off. You know, like that, that's the way I used to think. Um, and then I did a bit more, and it, everything turned out okay. So, you know, eventually, I think it turned out more than okay, Tony. <laughs> but eventually, you, you know, you learn to trust your own instincts, and, yeah. and that's all you've really got in this business. You know, you've got your own sense of, you know, what's right and what's wrong, and what's good and what's bad, and um, and that I think that's the thing that has to drive you. You know, like you know, you have to trust that, you know, what you believe is is what people want to watch. And speaking of uh, what drives you, and what's good and what's bad, a lot of your work. Um, and a lot of your productions go around those sort of themes like uh, Barracuda, Seven Types of Ambiguity. There's lots of um, inner turmoil and characters working out where they fit in. What is it about the, those sort of stories that really appeal to you? I guess the thing that I think drama contributes to um, audiences, what it offers an audience, is, you know, the thing that I like is the complexity of being human, like just the contradictions and the difficulties and the... You know, like you've got this tract running through your head of what the world should be like, and then you've got um, the reality of the world, yeah. and you know all the things about yourself that you you don't see, but you you know you, somehow you manifest them in your behaviour, and and I think that leads to very kind of interesting drama, and um, I think you know there's an audience for that kind of work because people like yeah. sort of you know s seeing the full complexity of their humanity manifested on screen. Do you think some of it for the audience is maybe a bit of therapy themselves, seeing some of their own internal struggles nutted out? Yeah, yeah, I think sometimes it's that. Or, or sometimes it's just like being able to relate to something that, that, and then through the story you're given an opportunity to feel, you yeah. know, and because, I, I mean, I think the thing about drama is that it's really just about feeling states. It's about, you know, like trying to um, convey to an audience, you know, you know, a certain kinds of feelings, like whether it's joy or love or, or anger yep. or, you know, like there or, or fear, you know, like they're all feelings that um, different genres of drama kind of create in an audience. And so, you know, whether you can make the audience feel that or not is actually a testimony to your skill. Like if you're good at what you do, then you can make the audience feel those things. I think it's a, a big testament to your skill. Uh, and speaking of feelings, there must have been a, a huge amount of feelings when clickbait went so <laughs> well and the billboards up in um, Times Square. It yeah. must have been in, insane. What sort of feelings were you going through? Did you expect that kind of 
you know, people just loving it so much? Uh, it was pretty crazy. <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> crazy. And, uh, and we were in lockdown in Melbourne. Yeah, so... you're like, I want to be in New York. I want to go and see this billboard. Well, I just wanted to even see some of my collaborators to celebrate with them. Yeah. So the best we did was we had a Zoom with all the, uh, you know, the directors and heads of department and we bought people cocktails. So that, oh, was, nice. that was our celebration and I Zoomed some of the actors and... Um, I imagine lots of people sent pictures back to you, you know, in front of the billboards going, hey, look what you've achieved. Yeah, and I mean, we didn't expect it because we were just this little show from yeah. Australia that was, you know, trying to sort of, um, you know, mat match it with the, you know, the big names in America and we... You know, we really struck a chord with audiences. Yeah. I thought that was, I think people loved the, you know, people love the mystery element of it and the, you know, and I think people liked the fact that it was all these different points of view. So that, you know, you got a different character yeah. each episode. And so I think people liked the sort of tasting menu. Sort Is it of sort of, um, you did that with seven types of ambiguity as yeah. well. Is there a, a particular reason you like seeing other points of view throughout it? I sort of, you know, the first time I worked on, a sh on that kind of format was on the slap. Yep. And, you know, like, Brilliant. I really love that. And, I, you know, and then, you know, Seven Types was another version of that. And I'd always wanted to do that particular format, which is, you know, this rotating point of view format, um, on a bigger crime, like yep. on a really big thing. And, and so clickbait was the opportunity to do that. And it was, um, I mean, I like it because I have a mathematical mind and <laughs> I sort of like... You know, like I like the challenge of trying, yeah. trying to make it all work. It's really, really hard to make work, by the way. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a high degree of difficulty. So you've gone from something big uh, and global like that to something really deeply personal to Australians uh, with fires. Yeah. Uh, how is it juggling something so raw and so new to people and still being able to find a way to make it entertaining? I guess, um, you know... We wanted to do it, like my, myself and my co-creator, Belinda Chaco, who was the showrunner of the show, we just felt really strongly that um, we had to have a national conversation about the impact of the fires, not only for uh, the public psyche and sort of dealing with grief, which I think that, you know, a lot of people haven't still had a chance to process. Yeah, yeah, and they're still dealing with it. But also the underlying uh, question of, you know, like climate change and, you know, I, I think... We, we try not to hit the audience over the head with that as a as a kind of message. But, or anything, but, but it's all hey, the way on. through the series. Yeah, it's all you know. Why did these fires happen? You know, and it sort of felt like well, it, we have to talk about that as a yeah. society, and you know, and we are talking about it all the time. So, so we just felt like that it was an important thing to do for us, and and we just tried to make it as, I mean. We used a lot of horror motifs. I'm not sure if you, you'd noticed, but throughout the series, there are, there are various kinds of, you know, like... Yeah, we, you are we borrowed on, edge, on genre. Seat throughout yeah. the audience. It does feel you know, quite scary. Yeah, we borrowed from genre a lot, and particularly episode three, you yeah. know, we, we talked about Wolf Creek when we were in the writer's room. We talked about um, all the different kinds of horror techniques of the sort of invisible monster. We even talked about Game of Thrones and the White Walkers. You know, like, um, <laughs> so, you know, we were trying to sort of marry, um, you know, like a realist drama with um, sort of genres that we thought could help, yeah. you know, bring, the, you know, give the audience something else as well. Oh, well. I think it's definitely not a horror what you've achieved. It's absolutely incredible. And ah, that sound, Tony, means it's time to play <laughs> a This or That. Uh, okay. 60 seconds on the clock, as okay. many questions as you can answer in this time. I'll give you two answers to choose from. Okay. You must choose one. Tony Ayres, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. okay, your time starts now. The slap Australian version or the US version? Australian version. Of course, the one you did. Uh, is the Australian film TV industry in good health or could it do with some vitamins? Vitamins. Yep. Uh, does pineapple belong on pizza? No. Oh, you disappoint me. <laughs> That's it. Oh, cut, cut. Uh, if you were to make any of the following books a TV series, which would it be? Spot Goes to the Zoo or Mr. Men's Mr. Tickle? Mr. Men's Mr. Tickle. Oh, of course, you tickle it? No, I won't. That's all right. Uh, who are easier to deal with, Australian actors or American? It's American. It's fine. Uh, for people thinking of working in the industry, get out and just do it or study? Uh, study. Study. Uh, and finally, can we expect more A grade Australian stories from Tony Ayres Productions in 2022? Hope so. Oh, I'm sure we will. <laughs> we are out of time. You can catch Tony's emotional but breathtaking series, Fires on ABC, catch up along with Barracuda, The Slap, and more. Clickbait on Netflix and all his other amazing works on virtually every other station and streaming service around. Uh, Tony Ayres, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. After the break, the cast.
of Melbourne Follies from Patrick's School of Arts performs for us. But while I go and question my life's purpose, here is your clue. It's a crown and a bubble with some dots. See you in a tick. <laughs> So that's the reason for my life. Interesting. Your clue was a crown and a bubble with some dots. It was, of course, the King's Speech. Uh, are there any other TV shows that you'd recommend people check out? Um... Like uh, anything maybe filmed in Melbourne? <laughs> Do you have like a... a, a what's your, what would be your favourite show in Melbourne at the moment? Uh, not sure. Not sure? No. Uh, what, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, what do you think of Ben Murphy? Ben Murphy? Uh, ben Murphy. Not the bottle shop? Oh, no, someone's been like to the ben bottle Murphy. shop. All of them. How yeah, many yeah. interviews have you done today that you've forgotten? Uh, this one already. Yeah, I'm hoping yeah, to yeah. forget this too. Yeah. Tell me about a time you've been on TV. Um, I don't think I have. You don't think you've ever been on TV? No. Like, never been in front of a camera? No. Never had someone with a microphone talking to you? No. No, do you have any idea where you are now? I'm in St Kilda. She needs medication. Patrick's School of the Arts has been giving Australia's leading dance professionals of tomorrow a chance to grow and learn for the past 15 years, providing students the best part-time and full-time training for their future careers in dance, music and theatre. As an avid fan of their work for years, I'm beyond excited they are back on stage with their latest production, Melbourne Follies. I'll be there and I hope to see you too. For a little taste of their extraordinary talents, please welcome the cast of Melbourne Follies! <laughs> Go. 
Norman Follies available now. A huge thanks. You make it look so easy to all our guests tonight and these amazing talents right here from Patrick Studios. Uh, we'll be back next week with an incredible cast of... Yeah, I've got to get up. I'm so sorry. Uh, next week, joined by Ryan Chevley and more. So, till then, look after yourselves and one another. I'm Ben Murphy. Bye-bye for now. Woo! <laughs>